So uh, welcome everyone. My name is uh, Sanjay Sarma. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering. And it's really a great pleasure to kick off the series. Um, as you would have seen in the email, the series is called uh, India 2.0. And uh, uh, we have this uh, wonderful handout that I think uh, may maybe many of you have. If you don't, let us know. We'll pass it down to you. Um, you know, I, I've got to tell you how, how this all got started. Um, uh, over the last few years, uh, SP and I, uh, you know, occasionally uh, talk about, uh, you know, what's happening around the world. And both of us, you know, him being a BITS graduate, I'm an IIT Kampur graduate, we often talk about India. Uh, some of it is uh, lament and some of it is hope, uh, depending on the circumstances. Um, but, uh, you know, w w many things that... Uh, uh, SP predicted have come true in the last few years. Uh, you may not know this, but uh, and I may be embarrassing him a little bit, but he actually anticipated the Indian Professional League of Cricket, IPL, which is one of the most successful franchises in the world in sports today, um, and actually uh, has really transformed uh, sports economics uh, in India. Uh, about uh, a few weeks, a few months ago, uh, we were talking separately, and uh, by the way, he's also been a prolific writer in the Economic Times. Um, now, MIT is this very interesting place. We get uh, folks uh, coming through. Uh, Nandan Neelakeni was here recently. Just passing through MIT, we had people like, uh, we have uh, Jairam Ramesh, who was at Harvard. He came and gave a talk. So, um, and as STEM and technology becomes predominant in the world, MIT's place as a bully pulpit, as a, a place to project great ideas, grand ideas, goes from one of prominence to one of necessity. In other words, I think it is our duty at some level um, to take, uh, take a, a more important, more um, uh, decisive role in, in, in um, talking about issues and, um, and making statements about where the world ought to go. There's no shortage of that. So a few months ago, as, uh, uh, SP and I were talking about a series of articles he's written in the Economic Times and then, uh, more specifically, he had this really wonderful set of recommendations about uh, for what India ought to do, especially with the new government. A time of change is a good opportunity. And I looked at them and I thought, my God, these are, these are really great, and we should have an MIT-wide discussion about this. And over time, perhaps a discussion uh, with the nation, with India, with America, uh, uh, and uh, with the press there, with thought leaders there. And this is the kickoff of that bigger movement. And we called it India 2.0, uh, also because the O, uh, because of Mala's great uh, design skills, has a wheel of dharma in it. Um, so it is my great pleasure today to talk, uh, to introduce uh, uh, SP. Uh, SP is well known to uh, many of you. Uh, he's the deputy dean at, um, at, at Sloan. Um, and uh, he's the uh, Gordon Billard, Professor of Accounting and Finance. Before that, he was Department Head uh, of, um, of Accounting. Um, and uh, uh, in between, and actually SP's uh, uh, resume is so, la is so uh, st studded with, uh, with uh, accomplishments that I have to actually need, I really need, need notes for this. Um, in between, he's, he was the Head of Equity Research at Barclays uh, 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 Global Investors. Invest Investors. And then um, in between, he's also been a consultant for ENY, KPMG. Uh, um, he's worked with uh, the Australian government. He has an honorary PhD from the Sid uh, University of uh, um, the Sydney University of Technology. Is that right, uh, SP? Did I say that University right? University of Technology, Sydney. Yep. Yeah. yeah, yep. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final comment I'll make is that uh, there's also an interesting uh, coincidence here. I am a product of IIT Kanpur. Uh, we have in our audience someone who helped create IIT Kanpur, uh, who will be going there for the 50, uh, which anniversary is that? 50th, 50th anniversary, coming up. So, um, and, um, uh, and SP is a product of Bits Pilani, both of whom, both, both institutions owe their existence in some part at least to MIT. So it's a great pleasure for me to introduce SP Kotari to, to kick off the series and talk about ideas for India. SP. Thank you. Thank you. Sanjay, thank you. Yeah, I should hire him as a publicist. What a great introduction. Thank you. you know, uh, it's, it's indeed, it, is, it has been quite a privilege. When I went in 1974 to uh, Bits Pilani, uh, one of the most important reasons was my dad and others, they said, gee, you know, it's MIT that, that has set up that institution. Something good will rub off. Go there. You know? so, so I'm always grateful for, uh, for what MIT has done. Uh, <clears throat> 
thank you for uh, giving me an opportunity to share some ideas. The, these are uh, these are some of thoughts over the years. Uh, naturally, having born and brought up in India and then migrated here, nonetheless, there is some passion for India. And, and as an economist, there always is, whether it is requested or not, they, they feel that it is their privilege and right to offer some advice. And, and in that tradition, uh, you know, so let me, let me uh, say, what should uh, India do to accelerate economic growth? Much of the discussion these days is about how high the growth rate already is. So in that sense, this kind of accelerate that further. I mean, you know, what kind of, uh, how, how greedy can you get? You know, that's the thought that comes to mind. But, but I want to set the stage as to why it is important to think in terms of accelerating the growth beyond where it currently is. And what's the rationale for that? Why we should think along those lines? And also to say that, is it plausible? Because what, what's the point? Of course, higher growth would be better than lower growth. But is it plausible? And what I want to do is to lay out a set of scenarios or, or policy recommendations that, at the end of which, at least you will think that, you know, it, it, it does seem plausible, that higher growth rate. So, so with that in mind, uh, let, let us, uh, sort of what's a top 10 list that I might come up with? But before I come up with the top 10 list, what I want to talk about is setting the stage as to why there is a need for thinking somewhat differently beyond where the current administration, which I admire, and it has been doing well in terms of it, it certainly has been a welcome change compared to what happened over the previous decade. So with that in mind, you know, I still think that it's not a set of game-changing policies that the current administration has come up with. And when you read the financial press, you will find that sometimes there are very complimentary articles and sometimes, gee, you know, they are falling short of our expectation. The euphoria seems to have been subsiding. So there is, there is at least some mixed uh, feeling about feelings about the uh, new administration, and the emphasis seems like better governance. That is one of the mantras, and certainly, who will argue with that? You know, better governance is better than bad governance. So, so that certainly would agree with that. But will that make all the difference? And the second is tweaking of some fiscal policy. Will that produce the kind of growth that is needed to make the lives of the common man, if you will, uh, better? in India. So, so where is that? Very often what happens is people talk in terms of the size of the economy. And that's very misleading. Size of New Zealand is pretty small, the economy. But people are quite happy. They are very prosperous. They are, okay. So in that sense, what matters is per capita. So in that landscape, if you look at where the per capita, India is currently about $1,500 per capita. How does that compare? China is about 6,000, Mexico about 10,000, Korea is about 22, and the US about 52. So it's a huge range. Okay? So India is only 3% of the US. Now people will say, gee, you know, purchasing power parity. And if you do that, well, maybe you will get to 3,000 or 4,000. And still, that is a far cry from where, where say, South Korea is or where uh, even Mexico is, okay? So now, you know, of course, going from 3,000 to 20 or 30,000, that is much farther into the future. So let us have some medium-term objective. If that is a stretch target, I would say, is to grow from 1,500 to 5,000. That is about a little more than tripling of the per capita income. That will require 10 years sustained growth of about 13 or 14%. And when people talk about GDP, one of the things that is often not understood is that you have to net out the population growth to get per capita. So if you say that, well, it grows at 8% and population growth is 1.5%, per capita is, will grow at 6 and a half. So that, that's good, but the point is it's not 8%. And when you compound it, that extra 1 or 1.5% one makes a huge difference, especially if you're talking about 3, 4, 5, or 6% growth rate, and you lop off 1%. So that's the sense in which 
you need 13 or 14 percent. And, and what is needed? What is needed? So here is my set of recommendations, if you will. Okay. First, something that doesn't get talked about nearly as much, it's almost like radioactive to talk about po population growth. But I think it is important to work on population growth. So what's happening? Right now, there are about 16 or 17 million people added to the population each year. That's a staggering number. If you take the entire IT sector in India, that doesn't have 16 million jobs, OK? So, and that is the population that is being. Of course, there is multiplier effect and all those things you add. But still, it, it gives you, puts things in perspective as to how big the challenge is, that you have to think about creating opportunities for as many as 16 and 17 million people additional on top of the one, almost 1 1.3 billion population. So what is needed, in my opinion, is to target economically underprivileged parents. See, you have to help them, give them a financial incentive to get, both get educated and have a smaller family. And that's what, coercion is not an option. That's not what, I would never ad advocate that. That's not what it is. But if we can think in terms of, we offer some incentive that, especially to women in India, given limited resources, you have to make some choices. So, you know, ideally it would, should be given to both boys and girls, but you start with boys and girls and offer financial incentive, but the incentive has to go to parents because in kids' education, parents have to be interested. They have. It's not like poor parents, they might be interested, but they may not have the time or they may not have the knowledge to educate. And therefore, you are trying to provide a financial incentive so that at least if they don't have the time, now the financial incentive will make it possible for them to devote some resources and take an active interest in their children. Okay. Now, this problem, by the way, you know, it might come across as, oh my God, you know, somehow Indian parents are. No, this is a worldwide phenomenon. You just go across the river and you have the same problem in inner cities in the US that you witness over there. So this cuts across. The economically disadvantaged is the common denominator. Otherwise, it cuts across all colors, races, everything, all populations. That's on average. There are always exceptions of, to the rule. Mr. Modi, we know he was son of a chaiwala and very poor upbringing, all those things. But those are exceptions. On average, this is true. So if we offer a financial incentive to parents, then you can make it into, make that money, that investment to work for the good. That the payments continue so long as the child is in school. Okay, you provide that. And you continue making payments even if the woman goes to college, right? When? And the conditions you might attach is that, well, you will continue to receive so long as you have up to two kids. If you choose to have more, that is the part that where there is no coercion, you, your choice, then, then the payment will continue so long as you have few children, you are educated. So the idea is to promote attributes, promote you know, uh, education as well as family planning without coercion but use financial incentives. So that is, that is this, in my opinion, this would be the best investment the government can do. You have to hold people somewhat accountable. You, you, you have to be, you, you have to show compassion because it has to be targeted to economically disadvantaged. At the same time, you have to hold people somewhat accountable so that it doesn't become an entitlement. It doesn't become a right in the sense of they getting money for not altering behavior. So uh, I'm going to take questions at the end, if you don't mind, right? You know, so, OK. We'll have a the yeah. end. Second is foreign direct investment. India has had a love-hate relationship with foreign direct investment. Mostly hate, I think, you know, and occasional love. So. And then regardless of whatever people say, the word that gets used is, oh, we have streamlined the investment policies or some or regulation. And I say that, well, 
first of all, recognize that foreign direct investment is needed. Because if you want to grow, you can grow either by enhancing productivity or by investing more. But when you have only $1,500 per capita, how much can you invest, right? Yes, 20%, 25%, but that is still on a per capita basis, a couple hundred dollars of investment. So you need, if you want to add some more growth, then you need some additional investment. If you look at all the countries that have grown over the last five, six decades, most of them have had enormous amount of foreign direct investment. Mexico has had more foreign direct investment with 10% of India's population, it has had more foreign direct investment than India has had in total dollar amounts, absolute, for 10% population. So on a per capita basis, it has had more than 10 times foreign direct investment. China, latest number, it has been $130 billion of foreign direct investment in China in one year compared to India's about $25 billion. So that also you see, and, and this 25 billion is a relatively high number for India. So if you, what India needs is something in the order of $200 billion. On a per capita basis, still it will come down to only $165. So in that sense, you, you, 200 billion might seem like a huge amount, but if you think in terms of this kind of investment, if it has to make a difference in the lives of an individual, then you have to think about how much investment was made for that particular individual. And that answer is $165 on an annual basis. So translated in a per capita basis, the number doesn't strike as gigantic. It seems something that is needed. The real challenge is attracting $200 billion, you have to completely make yourself, you have to transform yourself into make it an attractive destination for people to invest. People are savvy. When within India also, you look at it, what happened with the Tata Motors? From West Bengal, the investment went to Gujarat. Okay. Why? Because Gujarat said, look, we are a better place to invest. Gujarat didn't feel ashamed of saying that we are a better place to invest and call up Tatas. In an international setting, that's what you have to do. You have to demonstrate to the rest of the world, to the investors, that it is an attractive place to invest. Okay? It is not West Bengal, but it is Gujarat, that type of, and every state will have to do that. Okay? So foreign direct investment is critically needed. Without that, it will be impossible to achieve the kind of growth that is needed, organic growth, it's not going to happen to produce the kinds of numbers that if you want to go from 1,500 to 5,000. Okay. Empower people, decentralize. Seems so natural. I will give you the example. I live in Lexington. This is quite familiar to us. What does Lexington have? It has its own schools. It sets its own school agenda, right? You know, its curriculum is designed its own police force, there is own taxes, right? So when, when we say that no taxation without representation, that, that's what it has gone down to the town and uh, county level and city level and state level, right? In contrast, India, compared to the average population of a US state, which is about six million, the average population in India is about 50 million people. It's too large. In the US, there are tremendous amount of proposals to split states like California and New York because they, people think that they're too big and therefore people's voice is not heard in the capitals of those states. In India, UP is 200 million people. It's very difficult for the chief minister of UP to be representing 200 million people and thinking about that, that local voice is simply not heard. And it's not just about giving people their voice for the sake of giving voice, but 
as we always say, knowledge should guide who should be making decision. If there is a lot of local knowledge, then unless you give them decision rights, you are not really making decisions on the basis of knowledge, you are making decisions on the basis of some central authority, and that's not as productive. So you have to decentralize and empower people in a big way. So one first step would be to form something like 100 states in India and so that you would have far smaller states and there would be a local voice that would be heard to a much greater extent than currently. Privatizing the public sector, this is a big issue. How many times we have heard the same story by successive governments that they want to privatize the public sector. Okay. One, but the Air India is still public, the railways are still, the post office, the, so many banks, large number of banks, coal companies, steel companies, Bharat Heavy Electricals, you go on and on, more than 50%, so many of the oil companies, they are all owned and operated by the government horrible administration, okay. There are people here that, you know, if we think about president of MIT, Raphael, well, he joined in 1980. There is year in and year out, he was an academic and then became president, right? There you go, there would be some IAS bureaucrat who was something, 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 has gone through 10 different industries and then becomes Air India head or railways. How, how? I mean, you know, is the rest of the world getting it all wrong that they have people who are CEOs who have been in the same industry for decades and then become CEOs, whereas you think you can do it without that kind of industry-specific knowledge and having grown within that industry. So there is something quite wrong from the standpoint of efficiency. So the question is, how do you privatize? It's easy to say that privatize it, right? And thought long and hard about it. The biggest obstacle to privatization is employees don't want it which is understandable, I don't blame them, right? We all, we always say that act in self-interest. So there's nothing wrong in they saying that we don't want to privatize because that will take away the job security, the pension or whatever that comes with that employment. So they resist that. So what my, my thinking or proposal is, why don't we give ownership to those employees, okay? So that at least make it more difficult for them to resist privatization, right? Now, if we are saying that just take it, then it would, they would not have as much of a moral standing to say that, no, 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 this is bad, okay? Then the only condition that I would put is that make the company private, but stock is publicly traded and allow for market for corporate control. They work hard, the employees, they own it, they work hard, they do well, the stock price appreciates immensely, they profit, more power to that, okay? More power to that. If they don't work hard, they don't want to, then you know, the stock price might fall or some, someone might come and say that I can operate it more efficiently and that's what the role of M&A, mergers and acquisitions is, that's what the role of corporate control market is. So that's the sense in which that if you have some competition, if you have a publicly traded stock, and if you have a market for corporate control, these things can function quite well. They have functioned very beautifully in the rest of the world. There is no reason why half a dozen private oil companies in India wouldn't do well when in so many other parts of the world that kind of phenomenon has worked well. So same is true of academic institutions you know, or, or many other places that can be thought about how to privatize without necessarily antagonizing the organized employee sector or unions or, or uh, the organized employees without antagonizing them too much at least softening their resistance. It's not going to eliminate it, but it can soften it, and that might be a way to do it. 
Okay, laws are meant to be enforced. One, one of the, you know, one, one routine complaint that you hear from business executives abroad is that the law enforcement situation is horrible. There might be very wonderful laws. You know, don't steal and these kinds of, their basic laws are you know, pretty standard all over the world, in fact. Okay. It's the enforcement, it's the implementation. Now, India's problems, these are well known. And this is, I'm not telling anything new in that. But what is needed is to recognize that this is a serious impediment and make substantial investment in that. They are not overnight going to become totally saints and no corruption, no. But still, it would have a positive effect. Just making 100 states, you will have 100 high courts as opposed to only 25 high courts. That itself will make a big difference. So progressively, you know, having a much bigger law enforcement, both in terms of the judiciary side as well as the, the uh, law enforcement in the sense of police force or whatever, you know, that uh, will make a difference. It will also give confidence to people who are investing, people who are willing to make, engage in businesses, that India is a better place to do business. So, okay. Reform securities laws. There, there's still huge amount of laws about, you know, especially when it comes to mergers and acquisitions. Okay. So there, there still are laws that prevent M&A activity in India, and that is crucial. An investor who sees, they, they see how I want to exit also. It also influences your private equity market, your venture capital market. All of those are influenced because you don't have a well-functioning mergers and acquisitions market. You don't have security laws that can be enforced. You don't have laws that are welcoming to foreign investors. Here, there are many in this audience also might be sitting. This may or may not be the kind of audience that buys securities. But if you wish to, not too many questions would be asked. Are you a foreigner? Are you a domestic? There's that. Not many questions would be asked. Whereas in India, you would be paralyzed <clears throat> answering all those questions, and especially if you're an institutional investor. And so there is a long way to go. And this can be done easily. Building better institutions is crucial for economic development. Okay. Uh, regulation on a diet, and this is, you know, whether it is domestic and international trade, foreign currency convertibility, foreign investment through mutual funds, foreign ownership of property. I came here in 1986. I graduated from, uh, I got my PhD and went to Rochester. I bought a home. I was still a foreigner. I, I, I hadn't even had green card in my hand, and still nobody asked, gee, you know, how can you buy property? So as a foreigner, I didn't have to file some enormous amount of paperwork or keep reporting anything. So that's the sense in which you have to, if you want to attract capital, you have to make it somewhat easier both to buy and to sell. That is critical. So, so that's the sense in which travel visas, they are making it a little bit easier, but that has been the pet peeve for a long time of how onerous it is to enter or exit India. And, and that's the sense in which there are some, some issues. Foreign currency convertibility, people always say that, gee, you know, if you make rupee convertible, everybody will convert their money into dollars, and then you know, there would be huge pressure on that. And they're thinking in a static world. Because think about it. If you say that it is convertible, then the government or politicians you know, will have to start thinking into, well, what should I do to make holding of a rupee attractive? Of course, people will hold the money. If you put a fence around you, then you say that, gee, you know, the person is staying inside the fence. Well, of course, there's no choice. But the real trick is to provide the freedom and still Make the person want to stay within that premises. That's where you are adding some value. And that's the way to think about foreign currency convertibility. That what should I do to make it attractive? What has US done that to make it attractive for people to hold dollar? US doesn't prevent people from converting it into some other currency. 
So that's the sense in which can we give them freedom and still people voluntarily hold rupee. And the only litmus test to use is, do they hold or not? If they don't, that means you haven't done enough. You have to tweak, you have to transform, you have to innovate until people do hold voluntarily. And that would be the good exercise for the people, for the government to go through. I'm almost done. Okay. Independence of monetary policy, I'm, you know, this has been a little bit recently in debate, that you want to provide the Reserve Bank of India or the Central Bank with the objectives that you have, but then the tools that they use, how to achieve that objective, I think you have to give them the freedom, and that's what the uh, freedom of uh, monetary policy is. And then reality is the action is more on the fiscal side, on the more on the institutional. People care. We never say that, whoa, gee, you know, Sweden is such a nice and developed, prosperous country, or New Zealand is good, or some other country like that, because of the monetary policy. No. We think that there is education, there is people have uh, respect for law, there is some civic sense there is in people, and, and openness, there is law enforcement. Number of factors come to mind before we think about monetary policy. So, that said, it is important to give. Non-independent monetary policy can do a lot of harm, or bad monetary policy can do a lot of harm. And if you want to avoid that harm, then having good people like Raghuram Rajan and having the independence, I think those are good things. Uh, grandfather the past and look to the future. Every new administration comes and there is, we are going to, some truth commission or some other you know, past misdeeds, how we are going to correct those. That effort is with great energy, that effort is pursued. Okay. Bad idea. Okay. If you think about who is the lady from Tamil Nadu, right? You know, so Jaya Lalitha. She is still, if you look at the mansion that she is living in, 20 years they have been going after her. So, you are, if you fix law enforcement, you won't have that kind of problem to come about in the first place. So, going after those. Now, this government also, with great fanfare, said all the black money from abroad is going to come in. Not a rupee has come in. Not a rupee has come in. Okay? So, the point is to recognize that that's not where the action is. First of all, all these kinds of attempts are perceived to be partisan witch hunt and partisan, okay? But more importantly, they take your focus away from what's important to focus on something trivial as that, okay? India is not going to reach even if you bring all the black money into India or all the past people who have been corrupt to recover money from them, Jailalita or whosoever. India will be become better if you have, if you reform institutions, if you make it much more welcoming place, if you make education more effective, so on and so forth. So those are the things, and they are to focus on those, and therefore grandfather the past and look to the future. So anyway, so those are, those are the policies, and, and, and I tried to summarize these in terms of some uh, set of uh, policies. I always get uh, big uh, question mark to looking at forgiveness. That is the part that that and and I'm big believer of that. And if you if you look at even the uh, compare Indian politics with the U.S. Uh, here, someone a dissenting voice immediately the president of the party doesn't say you are expelled. Okay. It's, it's dissenting voice. Let us hear what the voice is. Whatever it is, sometimes ignore it. Sometimes not. But over there, it is always, okay, I'm going to form another party, or you are expelled, you know, that kind of, well, well, what kind of democracy there is? And, and really, what is missing is democracy within the party. That's a crucial piece. That is an extraordinarily important piece that is missing, and, and that needs to be fixed urgently. Parachuting Kiran Bedi in Delhi was not a good idea. She had not elected herself 
to be the chief ministerial candidate from BJP. Now, that's, there are many other things happened, and I'm not trying to blame it on just the parachuting, but if, if you were to think about it, that approach is not such a hard idea. With that, let me open it for questions. So, Thank you very much. Uh, I just wanted to add a couple of words. Uh, so the uh, uh, India 2.0, this, this whole uh, uh, mission will be supported by a, a forum, um, the, uh, sorry, will, will be governed by a, a committee. The forum will be governed by a committee. SP and I are the co-chairs and the other faculty involved are Tuli Banerjee, uh, Anantha Chandrakasan, um, Mala Ghosh, Simon Johnson, uh, and Bish Sanyal, and uh, I also especially wanted to thank Mala and Misty for arranging this and kicking this off, so thank you very much, Mala. Um, before we go for questions, I just want to tell you that you're going to see me, see me slip away uh, at 6.30, and that's because I have to catch a flight at 8, and then Mala is going to continue the Q&A. So with that, questions? So, Parul, you had a, yeah. So, these are all really, really good points. Um, I, I noticed that a lot of them are about um, focus, all of them focus very strongly on economic development, economic development, and I'm all about economic development, but one of these questions that comes um, is, yeah, we're talking about increasing the pie, but then the other question is how are we spreading that pie amongst the population, yep. right? And yep. is everyone getting their fair share of the growth? And that, that starts getting yep. the question of social development and stuff like that. And the classic argument is that of this trickle-down effect that when everyone makes money, you know, everyone gets wealthier, but classically that's not been the case, not in the US, not in India. Um, even when growth has happened. I noticed that none of the you know, principles were really talking or addressing issues around inclusive growth or inclusive capitalism or social equity of any sort. So what are your thoughts on that? And what are some tactical things that the government can do to promote that? Great point. OK, excellent. And, and I'm a big, you know, I'm, I'm one of those that peaceful coexistence of uh, extraordinarily free market at the same time thinking about the safety net. If you think about the first point, it's all about that. It is, you know, if, if, you, if you look at here, meritocracy and the second point is compassion and empathy for underprivileged. And if you look at the first point that was about providing financial assistance to the economically underprivileged to promote what? Education and small family. Both of those, I think, are going to empower. This is really teaching them how to fish and making it inclusive growth. Okay. So no country in the world has been prosperous with the kind of demographics that India has. Barring some oil countries, and they, they, they haven't socially progressed, they have economically some amount. Okay. So the point is we want to get literacy to go from 60% or low 60% that is there to 90% or so by providing financial assistance to those who are economically disadvantaged right now so that they will, with the incentive, with the financial supplement, take more active interest in education. They will go and demand that the teachers come to school as opposed to right now, there's no enforcement of that. There's no demand that is coming from the parents also nearly as much, and the teachers are being absent from schools. So that's the sense in which that's extraordinarily important because otherwise it would be, call it jealousy, call it anything, that the Inequality has the potential to influence. We are not going to get rid of inequality. I mean, you know, but that said, we can, we should provide opportunities for the less privileged so that they have an opportunity to climb the ladder of success. So that's, that's, that's what that is, you know, it's sure. important. Yeah. As for the mm -hmm. presentation, so I may get this wrong, but tell me if I'm wrong. So a lot of your proposals have the flavor of removing constraints. Yes. So the, the, I guess the underlying model is that the entrepreneurs are ready to work, the workers are ready to work, 
university graduate students are ready to jump into entrepreneurship if you remove the constraint. I don't know if that's enough to get you to 13, 14% of the growth, right. right? Without addressing, you know, some of the issues on the on the supply side, the lack of infrastructure, for example, and the <coughs> underdevelopment of I mean, and the biggest contrast between China and India is the manufacturing. Yes, so yes. Extremely difficult to scale manufacturing. Um, right. I, I'm not sure removing all these things would kind of address those issues. Um, Good point. In, in a timely manner, I don't no, know no. if it would. <coughs> so, so, in the interest of keeping this a little bit short, I didn't include the infrastructure, but that's a, an important, critical piece. And I have, okay. So, the privatization of the public sector, okay, is part of it, in the sense that what the government should do is exactly that invest in infrastructure. And right now, oftentimes, the government says, well, let us attract some private investment into that, okay? Private investment, so the good example is Mumbai Metro, okay? They started. What happened? Okay. They have the private investors there, okay? Initial fare was whatever, that was to make it attractive to get the whole thing, they had low fare. As soon as the metro started or they announced, they said, well, within in a month or so, we are going to raise the fares. Okay. Huge amount of uh, hue and cry about it. Okay. A commission has been set up now. And they are going to look into what would be the fair, appropriate fare. Okay. So the infrastructure investments are like a put option in the sense that they face the downside and not much upside. Because think about, if you invest in the metro, and suppose it starts to make a lot of money, what do you think will happen? People will say, hey, that person, that investor is price gouging. He's a monopoly, and he's making a lot of money, right? So let us impose some control and lower the fares, right? So the upside gets clipped. Then suppose that metro or that infrastructure project is losing money. Will people come running and say that, oh, you're losing money as an investor, raise the prices? No, it doesn't happen. It will happen with some delay. It will take some time. So as a result, you will have difficulty getting a whole lot of private investment into those infrastructure. So the government has to step in, and the government in India, they should, try invest fair bit in some infrastructure, but the resources are limited. So what they should do is free up resources from places where they shouldn't be and focus on places where they should be. The analogy I give is the role government oftentimes is like middle-aged man's hair. It's missing from where it is needed and it, is, it grows in where it is not needed, okay? So, so and that's what is, has to be reversed in some ways, so. Yes. Okay, so uh, speaking on that, um, so I'm a great, it's a Sloan School of Management, and there's a lot of entrepreneurship going on here. Uh, I'm an entrepreneur, I have a project, I wanna make, uh, you know, technology infrastructure to make uh, digital education, like Khan Academy, edX, those kinds of things, accessible on mobile phones, uh, and they want the mobile phone. So I think India is a perfect market for that. Uh, I have an OCI, I have connections to India, and I'd like to set this up in India. However, I think there's some problems in terms of uh, lack of support for bringing people like the Indian diaspora back to India to set up companies, especially technological infrastructure. If you look at, say, my other options out there, um, you know, you have Startup Chile, run by the Chilean government. That's very attractive for me. That, I mean, uh, and a lot of entrepreneurs, they have had a lot of success getting people to Chile, even people who've had no connection with Chile. Singapore is another great example. I think what's lacking is uh, either the institutional support to get diaspora back um, to India, maybe through connections between MIT and IIT uh, to get you know talented Indians back to India to start companies, or through the Indian government itself. For example, if there was a startup India, you know, I would be the first to sign up, because if, if I could get help setting up a company in an accelerator, I think that would be, uh, could be an important channel for growth as well. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, it, you have to 
sort of fire on all cylinders, as they say, right? And, and that, that aspect is definitely the case. Many of those things okay, would be solved if regulation is far less, if it is made it easier for you to hire how many licenses you might need or interstate businesses uh, or getting real estate ownership or rental. So making it easier to do business would go a long way. And on top of that, then the government might be able to focus on issues like that Startup India, or there would be other association that will come up and do the trick. And people will, in general, find it attractive to go and settle there if there are a lot of these things are made easier. The good example is that until recently, whether it is MBAs or IITs, they couldn't give the regular degree because University Grants Commission. Now, they had 50 years and they didn't pay attention to the fact that the whole world thinks the quality is high. There are so many market indicators, but they were sticking to whatever their set of rules as opposed to being recognizing what the substance is. So that kind of flexibility, that willingness to embrace merit, willingness to make it easier for businesses to flourish, that requires a somewhat different mindset, and it has to come from the top. Um, thank you. Um, some of the ideas I really appreciate, and one of them that I am trying to understand better is distributing uh, India into 100 states and decentralization sure. of power. Uh, what India has seen till now is that whenever states have been divided or new states have been created, they have not been very uh, politically stable. They have been politically volatile example, case in point, Jharkhand. Um, and they, they have not seen the economic growth that they were so meant to see. Also, the, the challenge of creating 100 states would be that the population size of those states would be smaller. Uh, and there can be chances that socially um, fringe elements can, can come to power, some, something that probably what's happening in Uttar Pradesh at the large scale can happen uh, at much, much smaller scales in uh, smaller states. So how do you reconcile the two? A, none of these solutions is perfect, okay? So in the sense that there always would be pros and cons. Okay? Now, if, if the belief is that 200 million people, Uttar Pradesh, that is the right size, then a lot of the people in the world must be getting it wrong, okay? So I'm, I'm, I'm just using some amount of what we see in many other parts that are well developed, giving people some power. In India, the always the argument is they would misuse it. Part of the reason they would misuse it is because there's no enforce, law enforcement. So none of these things is going to work piecemeal. If you combine law enforcement with more states, then you might say, gee, you know, yeah, I know someone might try to misuse it, but then if I impose law enforcement on that, then that misuse would be far less. Because now they are saying that, well, I will get caught. So it's not like that person will become sane, but would be <coughs> deterred from misusing it because they might fear the force of law. So that's the sense in which it's, it's a lot like okay, an operation. Okay. You can't say that, well, I have more anesthesia, though I can do less with a surgeon or with some instruments. No, you can't do that. Things have to be in some proportion. So that's the sense in which here, it is in some ways, it's a mosaic. It's, it's all the pieces have to hang together. And, and in that sense, you don't want to just do only one thing a whole lot. So I don't want you to think about 100 states in isolation, but in conjunction with many other pieces. Yes, sir. You mentioned the two hundred billion dollar figure. Uh, I just wanted to know what the numbers were for the cases of Japan, Korea, and, and other countries that you mentioned. Because two hundred billion right now is thirteen percent of Indian GDP. Is that two hundred no. billion dollar every year? I mean, not not yeah. by purchasing power parity. Yeah. Uh, could you t talk about some success story where that sure. number happened? And yes, yes. In fact, that's why I said you know for Mexico, for example, that. Mexico, the 200 billion on a per capita basis 
Mexico's population is 109 million or so, I think, somewhere in that range. So it's little less than one-tenth. So you would say $20 billion, right? They have been getting more than that. So that is one example. But that same thing, now China is not quite, it's 200 kind of range, but it's almost there. So China, in the recent years, China has had in excess of $100 billion per year. So that's the sense in which growth has taken place. Korea, Japan, they received fair bid. Japan was pretty good. And moreover, you know, many of these countries, their challenges were not as severe as India's. China's were. But like Japan was an economic powerhouse before World War II, then World War II, then the, you know, that. And then when they bounced back, but a lot of investment did come from abroad. So uh, Korea, when it started, even back then, their literacy rates were fairly high. They were not as bad as they are right now in India. So, so in that sense, different countries have been at different stages. But Mexico right now, their literacy rate is 91%, by the way. So, you know, I mean, we somehow, people don't think of Mexico, the image maybe of India, oh, doctors, lawyers or something. But in reality, you know, Mexico does quite well. So, yes? Um, what do you see as the role of agriculture in this whole growth? Excellent point. Excellent point. Of course, we want agriculture. Right now, agriculture has about 600 million people. Okay. The U.S. has 10 million people. 10 million people produce more agriculture than 600 million people. So that is one statistic to remember. Okay. Second, think about it. 600 million people and the total population is 1.3 billion. So let us say it is 1.2, just for you know, half. That means one farmer or one person engaged in agriculture is supporting one other person or, or selling output to one other person. You can't be very well off doing that. Only way an, a farmer would do well is if the output, he or she, the output is sold for one person in farming to 10, 20, 30 people outside. Then you would make a good living, right? So what does that mean? What that means is the number of people engaged in agriculture or farming sector will have to shrink dramatically with opportunities being provided in the service and manufacturing industry. Something that happened in China. You know, still the numbers are not quite the US type of numbers in China, but they had 100, 200 million people migrate from rural areas to urban centers. There is no other alternative. That's what will have to happen Many more urban centers will have to come up in India, but ultimately, it's simply not sustainable that half the population is engaged in agriculture. So now once that agriculture becomes with fewer people, now it's not going to happen overnight. This is, these are all things that will take decades, okay? But the real thing is you, you have to provide some opportunities so that it can be a little more mechanized. It can be larger farming lots are allowed. That's when some of the scale economies will come in. Otherwise, it's incredibly inefficient as it is currently. So, so again, it's, it's also a difficult issue. These are, these are challenges. It's all of these solutions, they are challenging because you have to manage transition. They're good from the starting point to the end point. It's the in-between which is the main action, and that's what makes it much more challenging. How are we on time? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, okay? You, you choose, who's her, you know, the, mm-hmm. Let me just see your original slide on the population growth. I assume that India's been growing steadily over the last decade, but what are some of the policies Yes, yes. Policies that have worked are like Kerala, education is much higher. And Kerala received a huge amount of foreign investment because so many of Keralaites went and worked in Middle East and they started remitting money. So it received 
foreign investment enormously. So the combination of those two things, much better education and economic well-being. Now, that experiment cannot be, we will say, well, why not use the same model elsewhere? Well, it's not possible to make billion people economically well off overnight. So that's where some intervention of making them at least some financial supplement to make them somewhat better off, but tie that financial supplement to education and family planning. So that, again, no coercion, but provide the incentive. So that's the idea that is being built. Okay. All right, so. I think we have time for one last question. One last yeah. question. All right. All right. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. people want to come up afterwards and ask. I know people have a clash. That's also the issue. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question around the uh, law enforcement. Sure. And uh, so you, I mean, you quoted the numbers say the Delhi High Court has a backlog of homes. And I've heard lots of really you know, incredibly large numbers like these. And I'm trying to get a sense of how many of the, I mean, like how intractable the problem is this. Is it just a question of throwing more judges at it? Or is it a question of, you know, if we really did simplify our legislation, a lot of those cases would just automatically go away. And that was one. And a related question is how do we resolve the question of property rights in India? Even as you mean about foreign ownership, etc., the current property boundaries are so disputed and so muddled. Are there other countries that have uh, found some fair or equitable way of resolving property disputes in a quick and efficient manner? Yeah. I think the first problem is a bigger one, okay, in the sense that, and there you are absolutely right, that part of the problem is are there enough judges? Part of the problem is how, for example, plea bargaining is not allowed in India. Okay, so issues like that. So can we reform the laws and make the processes somewhat more, you know, so amenable to to resolution? Okay. Uh, another is that naturally, if the law enforcement kind of is weak, then squatters' rights type of behavior kicks in. People don't want. People say, yeah, yeah, go to court. Okay, because you know that that's not going to get resolved. So, and that behavior will change if you know that, yeah, sure, the other side will go to court and get it resolved, then the behavior changes. So the part that, that's where economics is all about how people behave. So if you change the system, many times what happens is people think that the behavior was not going to change. That's where the problem comes because then they think that the policy is not attractive. So I gave the example of foreign currency convertibility, right? The reason that is not attractive is because they think it is static, that nobody will do anything and people will let all the capital to fly. That's not what it is. The moment you say that, okay, I'm going to make that policy, you start thinking about, it's like peeling the onion. You start thinking, okay, if I do that, People will start taking money. So what should I do to prevent them without forcing them to stay inside? So same thing. You have to, we have to think about what would happen. The other part that you are talking about that there are already a lot of disputes. Or I think different people have different perspective on that. I think the dispute might be on 5 or 10% of the land. And so, so in that sense, yes, there would be some issues. And is the process going to be fair or not? I always say that we have to ask two questions. Okay? One is, is, this, is the solution better than existing? Will it improve? And second, do you have a better alternative? Right? You know, if, if there's no point, I'm not trying to say to you, but in general in the debate, we have to ask, will it improve the circumstances? And if it does, people always, especially in India, they say, oh, but it's not a perfect solution. I understand, but do you have a perfect solution? No, then why, why you? Okay, why worry about the hypothetical perfect solution? So here is a better solution. If you don't have something better than that, let us embrace it. And that's, that's what I try to suggest, so. Thank you very, very much, Thank you. Thank you.